Preface and Introduction of A Color Notation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2017. A Color Notation by Albert Henry Munsell. A measured color system based on the three qualities hue, value, and chroma, with illustrative models, charts, and a course of study arranged for teachers. Second edition, revised and enlarged. Author's Preface At various times during the past ten years, the gist of these pages has been given in the form of lectures to students of the Normal Art School, the Art Teachers Association, and the Twentieth Century Club. In October of last year it was presented before the Society of Arts of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at the suggestion of Professor Charles R. Cross. Grateful acknowledgment is due to many whose helpful criticism has aided in its development, notably Mr. Benjamin Ives Gilman, Secretary of the Museum of Fine Arts, Professor Harry E. Clifford, of the Institute, and Mr. Myron T. Pritchard, Master of the Everett School, Boston. A. H. M. Chestnut Hills, Massachusetts, 1905. Preface to Second Edition The new illustrations in this edition are facsimiles of children's studies with measured color, made under ordinary schoolroom conditions. Notes and appendices are introduced to meet the questions most frequently asked, stress being laid on the unbalanced nature of colors usually given to beginners, and the mischief done by teaching that red, yellow, and blue are primary hues. The need of a scientific basis for color values is also emphasized, believing this to be essential in the discipline of the color sense. A. H. M. Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, 1907. Introduction The lack of definiteness which is at present so general in color nomenclature is due in large measure to the failure to appreciate the fundamental characteristics on which color differences depend. For the physicist, the expression of the wavelength of any particular light is in most cases sufficient, but in the great majority of instances where colors are referred to, something more than this, and something easier of realization, is essential. The attempt to express color relations by using merely two dimensions, or two definite characteristics, can never lead to a successful system. For this reason alone, the system proposed by Mr. Munsell, with its three dimensions of hue, value, and chroma, is a decided step in advance over any previous proposition. By means of these three dimensions it is possible to completely express any particular color and to differentiate it from colors ordinarily classed as of the same general character. The expression of the essential characteristics of a color is, however, not all that is necessary. There must be some accurate and not too complicated system for duplicating these characteristics, one which shall not alter with time or place, and which shall be susceptible of easy and accurate redetermination. From the teaching standpoint, also, a logical and sequential development is absolutely essential. This Mr. Munsell seems to have most successfully accomplished. In the determination of his relationships he has made use of distinctly scientific methods, and there seems no reason why his suggestions should not lead to an exact and definite system of color essentials. The Munsell photometer, which is briefly referred to, is an instrument of wide range, high precision, and great sensitiveness, and permits the valuations which are necessary in his system to be accurately made. We all appreciate the necessity for some improvement in our ideas of color, and the natural inference is that the training should be begun in early youth. 
the present system in its modified form possesses elements of simplicity and attractiveness which should appeal to children and give them almost unconsciously a power of discrimination which would prove of immense value in later life the possibilities in this system are very great and it has been a privilege to be allowed during the past few years to keep in touch with its development i cannot but feel that we have here not only a rational color nomenclature but also a system of scientific importance and of practical value h e clifford massachusetts institute of technology february 1905 end of preface and introduction Section 1 of A Color Notation by Albert Henry Munsell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in March 2017. Part 1. Chapter 1. Color Names. Writing from Samoa to Sidney Colvin in London, Stevenson says, perhaps in the same way it might amuse you to send us any pattern of wallpaper that might strike you as cheap pretty and suitable for a room in a hot and extremely bright climate it should be borne in mind that our climate can be extremely dark too our sitting room is to be in varnished wood the room i have particularly in mind is a sort of bed and sitting room pretty large lit on three sides and the color in favor of its proprietor at present is a topazi yellow but then with what color to relieve it for a little workroom of my own at the back i should rather like to see some patterns of unglossy well i'll be hanged if i can describe this red it's not turkish and it's not roman and it's not indian but it seems to partake of the last two and yet it can't be either of them because it ought to be able to go with vermilion ah what a tangled web we weave anyway with what brains you have left choose me and send me some many patterns of the exact shade where could be found a more delightful cry for some rational way to describe color he wants a topazi yellow and a red that is not turkish nor roman nor indian but that seems to partake of the last two and yet it can't be either of them as a cap to the climax comes his demand for patterns of the exact shade thus one of the clearest and most forceful writers of english finds himself unable to describe the color he wants and why simply because popular language does not clearly state a single one of the three qualities united in every color and which must be known before one may even hope to convey his color conceptions to another the incongruous and bizarre nature of our present color names must appear to any thoughtful person baby blue peacock blue nile green apple green lemon yellow straw yellow rose pink heliotrope royal purple magenta solferino plum and automobile are popular terms conveying different ideas to different persons and utterly failing to define colors the terms used for a single hue such as pea green sea green olive green grass green sage green evergreen invisible green are not to be trusted in ordering a piece of cloth they invite mistakes and disappointment not only are they inaccurate they are inappropriate can we imagine musical tones called lark canary cockatoo crow cat dog or mouse because they bear some distant resemblance to the cries of those animals see paragraph one thirty one color needs a system music is equipped with a system by which it defines each sound in terms of its pitch intensity and duration without dragging in loose allusions to the endlessly varying sounds of nature 
so should color be supplied with an appropriate system based on the hue value and chroma of our sensations and not attempting to describe them by the indefinite and varying colors of natural objects the system now to be considered portrays the three dimensions of color and measures each by an appropriate scale it does not rest upon the whim of an individual but upon physical measurements made possible by special color apparatus the results may be tested by anyone who comes to the problem with a clear mind a good eye and a fair supply of patience clear mental images make clear speech vague thoughts find vague utterance the child gathers flowers hoards colored beads chases butterflies and begs for the gaudiest painted toys at first his strong color sensations are sufficiently described by the simple terms of red color green blue and purple but he soon sees that some are light while others are dark and later comes to perceive that each hue has many grayer degrees now if he wants to describe a particular red such as that of his faded cap he is not content to merely call it red since he is aware of other red objects which are very unlike it so he gropes for means to define this particular red and having no standard of comparison no scale by which to estimate he hesitatingly says it is a sort of dull red thus early is he cramped by the poverty of color language he has never been given an appropriate word for this color quality and has to borrow one signifying the opposite of sharp which belongs to edge tools rather than to colors most color terms are borrowed from other senses when his older sister refers to the tone of her green dress or speaks of the key of color in a picture he is naturally confused because tone and key are terms associated in his mind with music it may not be long before he will hear that a color note has been pitched too high or that a certain artist paints in a minor key all these terms lead to mixed and indefinite ideas and leave him unequipped for the clear expression of color qualities musical art is not so handicapped it has an established scale with measured intervals and definite terms likewise coloristic art must establish a scale measure its intervals and name its qualities in unmistakable fashion color has three dimensions it may sound strange to say that color has three dimensions but it is easily proved by the fact that each of them can be measured thus in the case of the boy's faded cap its redness or hue is determined by one instrument the amount of light in the red which is its value is found by another instrument while still a third instrument determines the purity or chroma of the red the omission of any of these three qualities leaves us in doubt as to the character of a color just as truly as the character of the studio would remain undefined if the length were omitted and we described it as twenty-two feet wide by fourteen feet high the imagination would be free to ascribe any length it chose from twenty-five to one hundred feet this length might be differently conceived by every individual who tried to supply the missing factor to illustrate the tri-dimensional nature of colors suppose we peel an orange and divide it in five parts leaving the sections slightly connected below figure four then let us say that all the reds we have ever seen are gathered in one of the sections all yellows in another all greens in the third blues in the fourth and purples in the fifth next we will assort these hues in each section so that the lightest are near the top and grade regularly to the darkest near the bottom a white wafer connects all the sections at the top and a black wafer may be added beneath see plate one 
the fruit is then filled with assorted colors graded from white to black according to their values and disposed by their hues in the five sections a slice near the top will uncover light values in all hues and a slice near the bottom will find dark values in the same hues a slice across the middle discloses a circuit of hues all of middle value that is midway between the extremes of white and black two color dimensions are thus shown in the orange and it remains to exhibit the third which is called chroma or strength of color to do this we have only to take each section in turn and without disturbing the values already assorted shove the grayest in towards the narrow edge and grade outward to the purest on the surface each slice across the fruit still shows the circuit of hues in one uniform value but the strong chromas are at the outside while grayer and grayer chromas make a gradation inward to neutral gray at the center where all trace of color disappears the thin edges of all sections unite in a scale of gray from black to white no matter what hue each contains the curved outside of each section shows its particular hue graded from black to white and should the section be cut at right angles to the thin edge it would show the third dimension chroma for the color is graded evenly from the surface to neutral gray a pin stuck in at any point traces the third dimension a color sphere can be used to unite the three dimensions of hue value and chroma having used the familiar structure of the orange as a help in classifying colors let us substitute a geometric solid like a sphere and make use of geographical terms the north pole is white the south pole is black the equator is a circuit of middle reds yellows greens blues and purples parallels above the equator describe this circuit in lighter values and parallels below trace it in darker values the vertical axis joining black and white is a neutral scale of gray values while perpendiculars to it like a pin thrust into the orange are scales of chroma thus our color notations may be brought into an orderly relation by the color sphere any color describes its light and strength by its location in the solid or on the surface and is named by its place in the combined scales of hue value and chroma two dimensions fail to describe a color much of the popular misunderstanding of color is caused by ignorance of these three dimensions or by an attempt to make two dimensions do the work of three flat diagrams showing hues and values but omitting to define chromas are as incomplete as would be a map of switzerland with the mountains left out or a harbor chart without indications of the depth of water we find by aid of the measuring instruments that pigments are very unequal in this third dimension chroma producing mountains and valleys on the color sphere so that when the color system is worked out in pigments and charted some colors must be traced well out beyond the spherical surface paragraphs 125 to 127 indeed a color tree is needed to display by the unequal levels and lengths of its branches the individuality of pigment colors but whatever solid or figure is used to illustrate color relations it must combine the three scales of hue value and chroma and these definite scales furnish a name for every color based upon its intrinsic qualities and free from terms purloined in other sensations or caught from the fluctuating colors of natural objects how this system describes the spectrum the solar spectrum and rainbow are the most stimulating color experiences with which we are acquainted can they be described by this solid system the lightest part of the spectrum is a narrow field of greenish yellow 
grading into darker red on one side and into darker green upon the other followed by still darker blue and purple upon the sphere the values of these spectral colors trace a path high up on the yellow section near white and slanting downwards across the red and green sections which are traversed near the level of the equator it goes on to cross the blue and purple well down toward black this forms an inclined circuit crossing the equator at opposite points and suggests the ecliptic or the rings of saturn see outside cover a pale rainbow would describe a slanting circuit nearer white and a dimmer one would fall within the sphere while an intensely brilliant spectrum projects far beyond the surface of the sphere so greatly is the chroma of its hues in excess of the common pigments with which we work out our problems at the outset it is well to recognize the place of the spectrum in this system not only because it is the established basis of scientific study but especially because the invariable order assumed by its hues is the only stable hint which nature affords us in her infinite color play all our color sensations are included in the color solid none are left out by its scales of hue value and chroma indeed the imagination is led to conceive and locate still purer colors than any we now possess such increased degrees of color sensation can be named and clearly conveyed by symbols to another person as soon as the system is comprehended end of section one section two of a Color Notation by Albert Henry Mansell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaii in March 2017. Appendix to Chapter 1 Misnomers for Color. The Century Directory helps an intelligent study of color by its clear definitions and cross references to hue, value, and chroma leaving no excuse for those who would confuse these three qualities or treat a degree of any quality as the quality itself obscure statements were frequent in textbooks before these new definitions appeared thus the term shade should be applied only to darkened values and not to hues or chromas yet one writer says this yellow shades into green which is certainly a change of hue and then speaks of a brighter shade in spite of his evident intention to suggest a stronger chroma which is neither a shade nor a brighter luminosity children gain wrong notions of tint and shade from the so-called standard colors shown to them which present tints of red and blue much darker than the shades of yellow this is bewildering and like their elders they soon drop into the loose habit of calling any degree of color strength or color light a shade value is a better term to describe the light which color reflects to the eye and all color values light or dark are measured by the value scale tone is used in a confusing way to mean different things thus in the same sentence we see it refers to a single touch of the brush which is not a tone but a paint spot and then we read that the tone of the canvas is golden this cannot mean that each paint spot is the color of gold but is intended to suggest that the various objects depicted seem enveloped in a yellow atmosphere tone is in fact a musical term appropriate to sound but out of place in color it seems better to call the brush touch a color spot then the result of a harmonious relation between all the spots is color envelope or as in rude the chromatic composition intensity is a misleading term if chroma be intended for it depends on the relative light of spectral hues it is a degree rather than a quality as appears in the expressions 
intense heat light sound intensity of stimulus and reaction being a degree of many qualities it should not be used to describe the quality itself the word becomes especially unfit when used to describe two very different phases of a color as its intense illumination where the chroma is greatly weakened and the strongest chroma which is found in a much lower value purity is also to be avoided in speaking of pigments for not one of our pigments represents a single pure ray of the spectrum examples are constantly found of the mental blur caused by such unfortunate terms and since misunderstanding becomes impossible with measured degrees of hue value and chroma it seems only a question of time when they will take the place of tint tone shade purity and intensity end of section two section three of a color notation by albert henry munsell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in march two thousand seventeen chapter two color qualities the three color qualities are hue value and chroma hue is the name of a color hue is the quality by which we distinguish one color from another as a red from a yellow a green a blue or a purple this names the hue but does not tell whether it is light or dark weak or strong leaving us in doubt as to its value and its chroma science attributes this quality to difference in the length of ether waves impinging on the retina which causes the sensation of color the wavelength m five two six nine gives a sensation of green while m six eight six seven gives a sensation of red value is the light of a color value is the quality by which we distinguish a light color from a dark one color values are loosely called tints and shades but the terms are frequently misapplied a tint should be a light value and a shade should be darker but the word shade has become a general term for any sort of color so that a shade of yellow may prove to be lighter than a tint of blue a photometric scale of value places all colors in relation to the extremes of white and black but cannot describe their hue or their chroma science describes this quality as due to difference in the height or amplitude of ether waves impinging on the retina small amplitudes of the wavelengths given in paragraph twenty one produce the sensation of dark green and dark red larger amplitudes give the sensation of lighter green and lighter red chroma is the strength of a color chroma is the quality by which we distinguish a strong color from a weak one to say that a rug is strong in color gives no hint of its hues or values only its chromas loss of chroma is loosely called fading but this word is frequently used to include changes of value and hue take two autumn leaves identical in color and expose one to the weather while the other is waxed and pressed in a book soon the exposed leaf fades into a neutral gray while the protected one preserves its strong chroma almost intact if in fading the leaf does not change its hue or its value there is only a loss of chroma but the fading process is more likely to induce some change of the other two qualities fading however cannot define these changes science describes chroma as the purity of one wavelength separated from all others other wavelengths intermingling make its chroma less pure a beam of daylight can combine all wavelengths in such a balance as to give the sensation of whiteness because no single wave is in excess the color sphere see figure one is a convenient model to illustrate these three qualities hue value and chroma and unite them by measured scales 
the north pole of the color sphere is white and the south pole black value or luminosity of colors ranges between these two extremes this is the vertical scale to be memorized as v the initial for both value and vertical vertical movement through color may thus be thought of as a change of value but not as a change of hue or of chroma hues of color are spread around the equator of the sphere this is a horizontal scale memorized as h the initial for both hue and horizontal horizontal movement around the color solid is thus thought of as a change of hue but not of value or of chroma a line inward from the strong surface hues to the neutral gray axis traces the graying of each color which is loss of chroma and conversely a line beginning with neutral gray at the vertical axis and becoming more and more colored until it passes outside the sphere is a scale of chroma which is memorized as c the initial both for chroma and center thus the sphere lends its three dimensions to color description and a color applied anywhere within without or on its surface is located and named by its degree of hue of value and of chroma hues first appeal to the child values next and chromas last color education begins with ability to recognize and name certain hues such as red yellow green blue and purple see paragraphs 182 and 183 nature presents these hues in union with such varieties of value and chroma that unless there be some standard of comparison it is impossible for one person to describe them intelligently to another the solar spectrum forms a basis for scientific color analysis taught in technical schools but it is quite beyond the comprehension of a child he needs something more tangible and constantly in view to train his color notions he needs to handle colors place them side by side for comparison imitate them with crayons paints and colored stuffs so as to test the growth of perception and learn by simple yet accurate terms to describe each by its hue its value and its chroma pigments rather than the solar spectrum are the practical agents of color work certain of them selected and measured by this system see chapter five will be known as middle colors because they stand midway in the scales of value and chroma these middle colors are preserved in imperishable enamels so that the child may handle and fix them in his memory and thus gain a permanent basis for comparing all degrees of color he learns to grade each middle color to its extremes of value and chroma experiments with crayons and paints and efforts to match middle colors train his color sense to finer perceptions having learned to name colors he compares them with the enamels of middle value and can describe how light or dark they are later he perceives their differences of strength and comparing them with the enamels of middle chroma can describe how weak or strong they are thus the full significance of these middle colors as a practical basis for all color estimates becomes apparent and when at a more advanced stage he studies the best examples of decorative color he will again encounter them in the most beautiful products of oriental art is it possible to define the endless varieties of color at first glance it would seem almost hopeless to attempt the naming of every kind and degree of color but if all these varieties possess the same three qualities only in different degrees and if each quality can be measured by a scale then there is a clue to this labyrinth a color sphere and color tree to unite hue value and chroma this clue is found in the union of these three qualities by measured scales in a color sphere and color tree the equator of the sphere may be divided into ten parts and serve as the scale of hue marked r y r y g y g b g b 
PB, P, and RP. Its vertical axis may be divided into ten parts to serve as the scale of value, numbered from black, zero, to white, ten. Any perpendicular to the neutral axis is a scale of chroma. On the plane of the equator this scale is numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, from the center to the surface. This chroma scale may be raised or lowered to any level of value, always remaining perpendicular to the axis and serving to measure the chroma of every hue at every level of value. The fact that some colors exceed others to such an extent as to carry them out beyond the sphere is proved by measuring instruments, but the fact is a new one to many persons. Figures 2 and 3. For this reason the color tree is a completer model than the sphere, although the simplicity of the latter makes it best for a child's comprehension. The color tree is made by taking the vertical axis of the sphere which carries a scale for value for the trunk. The branches are at right angles to the trunk, and, as in the sphere, they carry the scale of chroma. Colored balls on the branches tell their hue. In order to show the maxima of color, each branch is attached to the trunk, or neutral axis, at a level demanded by its value, the yellow nearest white at the top, then the green, red, blue and purple branches, approaching black in the order of their lower values. It will be remembered that the chroma of the sphere ceased with five at the equator. The colored tree prolongs this through six, seven, eight and nine. The branch ends carry colored balls, representing the most powerful red, yellow, green, blue and purple pigments which we now possess and could be lengthened should stronger chromas be discovered. Such models set up a permanent image of color relations. Every point is self-described by its place in the united scales of hue, value, and chroma. These scales fix each new perception of color in the child's mind by its situation in the color solid. The importance of such a definite image can hardly be overestimated, for without it one color sensation tends to efface another. When the child looks at a color and has no basis of comparison, it soon leaves a vague memory that cannot be described. These models, on the contrary, lead to an intelligent estimate of each color in terms of its hue, its value, and its chroma, while the permanent enamels correct any personal bias by a definite standard. Thus defined, a color falls into logical relation with all other colors in the system and is easily memorized, so that its image may be recalled at any distance of time or place by the notation. These solid models help to memorize and assemble colors, and the memory is further strengthened by a simple notation which records each color so that it cannot be mistaken for any other. By these written scales a child gains an instinctive estimate of relations, so that, when he is delighted with a new color combination, its proportions are noted and understood. Musical art has long enjoyed the advantages of a definite scale and notation. Should not the art of coloring gain by similar definition? The musical scale is not left to personal whim, nor does it change from day to day, and something as clear and stable would be an advantage in training the color sense. Perception of color is crude at first. The child sees only the most obvious distinctions and prefers the strongest stimulation. But perception soon becomes refined by exercise, and when a child tries to imitate the subtle colors of nature with paints, he begins to realize that the strongest colors are not the most beautiful, rather the tempered ones, which may be compared to the moderate sounds in music. To describe these tempered colors, he must estimate their hue, value, and chroma, and be able to describe in what degree his copy departs from the natural color. And, with this gain in perception and imitation of natural color, he finds a strong desire to invent combinations to please his fancy. 
thus the study divides into three related attitudes which may be called recognition imitation and invention recognition of color is fundamental but it would be tedious to spend a year or two in formal and dry exercises to train recognition of color alone for each step in recognition of color is best tested by exercise in its imitation and arrangement when perception becomes keener emphasis can be placed on imitation of the colors found in art and in nature resting finally on the selection and grouping of colors for design every color can be recognized named matched imitated and written by its hue value and chroma the notation used in this system places hue expressed by an initial at the left value expressed by a number at the right and above a line and chroma also expressed by a number at the right below the line thus r five over nine means hue red value five over chroma nine and will be found to represent the qualities of the pigment vermilion hue value and chroma unite in every color sensation but the child cannot grasp them all at once hue difference appeals to him first and he gains a permanent idea of five principal hues from the enamels of middle colors learning to name match imitate and finally write them by their initials r red y yellow g green b blue and p purple intermediates formed by uniting successive pairs are also written by the joint initials y r yellow red g y green yellow b g blue green p b purple blue and r p red purple ten differences of hue are as many as a child can render at the outset yet in matching and imitating them he becomes aware of their light and dark quality and learns to separate it from hue as value difference middle colors as implied by that name stand midway between white and black that is on the equator of the sphere so that a middle red will be written r five over suggesting the steps six seven eight and nine which are above the equator while steps four three two and one are below it is well to show only three values of a color at first for instance the middle value contrasted with a light and a dark one these are written r three over r five over r seven over soon he perceives and can imitate finer differences and the red scale may be written entire as r one over r two over r three over r four over r five over r six over r seven over r eight over r nine over with black as nine and white as ten chroma difference is the third and most subtle color quality the child is already unconsciously familiar with the middle chroma of red having had the enamels of middle color always in view and the red enamel is to be contrasted with the strongest and weakest red chromas obtainable these he writes r over one r over five r over nine seeing that this describes the chromas of red but leaves out its values r five over one r five over five r five over nine is the complete statement showing that while both hue and value are unchanged the chroma passes from grayish red to middle red enamel first learned and out to the strongest red in the chroma scale obtained by vermilion it may be long before he can imitate the intervening steps of chroma Many children find it difficult to express more than five steps of the chroma scale, although easily making ten steps of value and from twenty to thirty-five steps of hue. This interesting feature is of psychologic value and has been followed in the color tree and color sphere. 
does such a scientific scheme leave any outlet for feeling and personal expression of beauty lest this exact attitude in color study should seem inartistic compared with the free and almost chaotic methods in use let it be said that the stage thus far outlined is frankly disciplinary it is somewhat dry and unattractive just as the early musical training is fatiguing without inventive exercises the child should be encouraged at each step to exercise his fancy instead of cramping his outlook upon nature it widens his grasp of color and stores the memory with finer differences supplying more material by which to express his sense of coloristic beauty color harmony as now treated is a purely personal affair difficult to refer to any clear principles or definite laws the very terms by which it seeks expression are borrowed from music and suggest vague analogies that fail when put to the test color needs a new set of expressive terms appropriate to its qualities before we can make an analysis as to the harmony or discord of our color sensations this need is supplied in the present system by measured charts and a notation their very construction preserves the balance of colors as will be shown in the next chapter while the chapter on harmony chapter seven shows how harmonious parts and triads of color may be found by masks with measured intervals in fact practice in the use of the charts supplies the imagination with scales and sequences of color quite as definite and quite as easily written as those sound intervals by which the musician conveys to others his sense of harmony and although in neither art can training alone make the artist yet a technical grasp of these formal scales gives acquaintance with the full range of the instrument and is indispensable to artistic expression from these color scales each individual is free to choose combinations in accord with his feeling for color harmony let us make an outline of the course of color study traced in the preceding pages perception of color hue difference middle hues five principles middle hues five intermediates middle hues ten placed in sequence as scale of hue value difference light middle and dark values without change of hue light middle and dark values traced with five principal hues ten values traced with each hue scale of value the color sphere chroma difference strong middle and weak chroma without change of hue strong middle and weak chroma traced with three values without change of hue strong middle and weak chroma traced with three values and ten hues maxima of color and their gradation to white black and gray the color tree expression of color matching and imitation of hues using stuffs crayons and paints matching and imitation of values and hues using stuffs crayons and paints matching and imitation of chromas values and hues using stuffs crayons and paints notation of color hue value over chroma h v over c initial for hue numeral above for value numeral below for chroma sequences of color two scales united as hue and value or chroma and value three scales united each step a change of hue value and chroma balance of color opposites of equal value and chroma r five over five and b g five over five opposites of equal value and unequal chroma r five over nine and b g five over three opposites unequal both in value and chroma r seven over three and b g three over seven area as an element of balance harmony of color 
selection of colors that give pleasure study of butterfly wings and flowers recorded by the notation study of painted ornaments rugs and mosaics recorded by the notation personal choice of color pairs balanced by h v c and area personal choice of color triads balanced by h v c and area grouping of colors to suit some practical use wallpapers rugs book covers etc their analysis by the written notation search for principles of harmony expressed in measured terms a definite plan of color study with freedom as to details of presentation having memorized these broad divisions of the study a clever teacher will introduce many a detail to meet the mood of the class or correlate this subject with other studies without for a moment losing the thread of thought or befogging the presentation but to range at random in the immense field of color sensations without plan or definite aim in view only courts fatigue of the retina and a chaotic state of mind the same broad principles which govern the presentation of other ideas apply with equal force in this study a little well apprehended is better than a mass of undigested facts if the child is led to discover or at least to think he is discovering new things about color the mind will be kept alert and seek out novel illustrations at every step now and then a pupil will be found who leads both teacher and class by intuitive appreciation of color and it is a subtle question how far such a nature can be helped or hurt by formal exercises but such an exception is rare and goes to prove that systematic discipline of the color sense is necessary for most children outdoor nature and indoor surroundings offer endless color illustrations birds flowers minerals and the objects in daily use take on a new interest when their varied colors are brought into a conscious relation and clearly named a tri-dimensional perception like this sense of color requires skillful training and each lesson must be simplified to the last point practicable it must not be too long and should lead to some definite result which a child can grasp and express with tolerable accuracy while its difficulties should be approached by easy stages so as to avoid failure or discouragement the success of the present effort is the best incentive to further achievement end of section three Section 4 of A Color Notation by Albert Henry Mansell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in March 2017. Appendix to Chapter 2. Plate 1. The Color Sphere with Measured Scales of Hue, Value, and Chroma. The teacher of elementary grades introduces these scales of tempered color as fast as the child's interest is awakened to their need by the exercises shown in plates two and three. Thus the hue scale is learned before the end of the second year, the value scale during the next two years, and the chroma scale in the fifth year. By the time a child is ten years old, these definite color scales have become part of his mental furnishing so that he can name write and memorize any color group one the color sphere in skeleton this diagram shows the middle colors on the equator with strong red yellow green blue and purple each at its proper level in the value scale and projecting in accordance with its scale of chroma see the complete description of these scales in chapter two two the color score fifteen typical steps taken from the color sphere are here spread out in a flat field the five middle colors from the center level with the same hues in a lighter value above and in the darker value below chapter six describes the making of this score and its use in analyzing colors and preserving a written record of their groups three the value scale and chroma scale 
each of the five color maxima is thus shown at its proper level in the scale of light and graded by uniform steps from its strongest chroma inward to neutrality at the axis of the sphere pigment inequalities here become very apparent for plates two and three see appendix to chapter four children's color studies end of section four section five of a color notation by albert henry mansell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in april two thousand seventeen chapter three color mixture and balance all colors grasped in the hand let us recall the names and order of colors given in the last chapter with their assemblage in a sphere by the three qualities of hue value and chroma it will aid the memory to call the thumb of the left hand red the forefinger yellow the middle finger green the ring finger blue and the little finger purple when the fingertips are in a circle they represent a circuit of hues which has neither beginning nor end for we can start with any finger and trace a sequence forward or backward now close the tips together for white and imagine that the five strong hues have slipped down to the knuckles where they stand for the equator of the color sphere still lower down at the wrist is black the hand thus becomes a color holder with white at the fingertips black at the wrist strong colors around the outside and weaker colors within the hollow each finger is a scale of its own color with white above and black below while the graying of all the hues is traced by imaginary lines which meet in the middle of the hand thus a child's hand may be his substitute for the color sphere and also make him realize that it is filled with grayer degrees of the outside colors all of which melt into gray in the center neighborly and opposite hues and their mixture let this circle figure seven stand for the equator of the color sphere with the five principal hues written by their initials r y g b and p spaced evenly about it some colors are neighbors as red and yellow while the others are opposites as soon as a child experiments with paints he will notice the different results obtained by mixing them first the neighbors that is any pair which lie next one another as red and yellow will unite to make a hue which retains a suggestion of both it is intermediate between red and yellow and we call it yellow red green and yellow unite to form green yellow blue and green make blue green and so on with each succeeding pair these intermediates are to be written by their initials and inserted in their proper place between the principal hues it is as if an orange were split into ten sectors instead of five with red yellow green blue and purple as alternate sectors while half of each adjoining color pair were united to form the sector between them the original order of five hues is in no wise disturbed but linked together by five intermediate steps here is a table of the intermediates made by mixing each pair red and yellow unite to form yellow red y r popularly called orange yellow and green unite to form green yellow g y popularly called grass green green and blue unite to form blue green b g popularly called peacock blue blue and purple unite to form purple blue p b popularly called violet purple and red unite to form red purple r p popularly called plum using the left hand again to hold colors the principal hues remain unchanged on the knuckles but in the hollows between them are placed intermediate hues so that the circle now reads red yellow red yellow green yellow green 
blue-green, blue, purple-blue, blue, purple, and red-purple, back to the red with which we started. This circuit is easily memorized so that the child may begin with any color point and repeat the series clockwise, that is, from left to right, or in reverse order. Each principal hue has thus made two close neighbors by mixing with the nearest principal hue on either hand. The neighbors of red are a yellow red on one side and a purple red on the other. The neighbors of green are a green yellow on one hand and a blue green on the other. It is evident that a still closer neighbor could be made by again mixing each consecutive pair in this circle of ten hues and if the process were continued long enough the color steps would become so fine that the eye could only see a circuit of hues melting imperceptibly one into another but it is better for the child to gain a fixed idea of red yellow green blue and purple with their intermediates before attempting to mix pigments and these ten steps are sufficient for primary education next comes the question of opposites in this circle a line drawn from red through the center finds its opposite blue green if these colors are mixed they unite to form gray indeed the center of the circle stands for a middle gray not only because it is the center of the neutral axis between black and white but also because any pair of opposites will unite to form gray this is a table of five mixtures which make neutral gray opposites red and blue green yellow and purple blue green and red purple blue and yellow red purple and green yellow each pair of which unites in neutral gray but if instead of mixing these opposite hues we place them side by side the eye is so stimulated by their difference that each seems to gain in strength, that is, each enhances the other when separate, but destroys the other when mixed. This is a very interesting point to be more fully illustrated by the help of a color wheel in Chapter 5, paragraph 106. What we need to remember is that the mixture of neighborly hues makes them less stimulating to the eye because they resemble each other, while a mixture of opposite hues extinguishes both in a neutral gray. Hues once removed and their mixture. There remains the question, what will happen if we mix not two neighbors, nor two opposites, but a pair of hues once removed in the circle, such as red and green? A line joining this pair does not pass through the neutral center, but to one side nearer yellow, which shows that this mixture falls between neutral gray and yellow, partaking somewhat of each. In the same way, a line joining yellow and blue shows that their mixture contains both green and gray. Indeed, a line joining any two colors in the circuit may be said to describe their union. A radius crossing this line passes to some hues on the circumference and describes by its intersection with the first line the chroma of the color made by a mixture of the two original colors. Red and green make yellow-gray. Yellow and blue make green-gray. Green and purple make blue-gray. Blue and red make purple-gray purple and yellow make red-gray. Each pair unites in a colored gray, which is an intermediate hue of weak chroma. Mixture of white and black, a scale of grays. So far we have thought only of the plane of the equator, with its circle of middle hues in ten steps, and studied their mixture by drawing lines to join them. Now let us start at the neutral center, and think upward to white and downward to black. This vertical line is the neutral axis joining the poles of white and black, which represent the opposites of light and darkness. Middle gray is halfway between. If black is called zero and white is ten, 
then the middle point is five with six seven eight and nine above while four three two and one are below thus making a vertical scale of grays from black to white if left to personal preference an estimate of middle value will vary with each individual who attempts to make it this appears in the neutral scales already published for schools and students who depend upon them discover a variation of over ten per cent in the selection of middle gray since this value scale underlies all color work it needs accurate adjustment by scientific means as in scales of sound of length of weight or of temperature a photometer photo light and meter a measure is shown on the next page it measures the relative amount of light which the eye receives from any source and so enables us to make a scale with any number of regular steps the principle on which it acts is very simple a rectangular box divided by a central partition into halves has symmetrical openings in the front walls which permit the light to reach two white fields placed upon the back walls if one looks in through the observation tube both halves are seen to be exactly alike and the white fields equally illuminated a valve is then fitted to one of the front openings so that the light in that half of the photometer may be gradually diminished its white field is thus darkened by measured degrees and becomes black when all light is excluded by the closed valve while this darkening process goes on in one half of the instrument the white field in the other half does not change and looking into the eyepiece the observer sees each step contrasted with the original white one half is thus said to be variable because of its valve and the other side is said to be fixed a dial connected with the valve has a hand moving over it to show how much light is admitted to the field in the variable half let us now test one of these personal decisions about middle value a sample replaces the white field in the fixed half and by means of the valve the white field in the variable half is alternately darkened and lightened until it matches the sample and the eye sees no difference in the two the dial then discloses the fact that this supposedly middle value reflects only forty two per cent of the light that is to say it is nearly a whole step too low in a decimal scale other samples are nearly as far on the light side of middle value and further tests prove not only the varying color sensitiveness of individuals but detect a difference between the left and right eye of the same person the vagaries of color estimate thus disclosed lead some to seek shelter in feeling and inspiration but feeling and inspiration are temperamental and have nothing to do with the simple facts of vision a measured and unchanging scale is as necessary and valuable in the training of the eye as the musical scale in the discipline of the ear it will soon be necessary to talk of the values in each color we may distinguish the values on the neutral axis from color values by writing them n1 n2 n3 n4 n5 n6 n7 n8 n9 n10 such a scale makes it easy to foresee the result of mixing light values with dark ones any two gray values unite to form a gray midway between them thus n4 and n6 being equally above and below the center unite to form n5 as will also n7 and n3 n8 and n2 or n9 and n1 but n9 and n3 will unite to form n6 which is midway between 6 and 9 when this numbered scale of values is familiar it serves not only to describe light and dark grays but the value of colors which are at the same level in the scale thus r7 popularly called a tint of red is neither lighter nor darker than the gray of n7 a numeral written above to the right always indicates value 
whether of a gray or a color, so that R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7, R8, R9, describes a regular scale of red values from black to white, while G1, G2, G3, etc. is a scale of green values. This matter of a notation for colors will be more fully worked out in Chapter 6, but the letters and numerals already described greatly simplify what we are about to consider in the mixture and balance of colors. Mixture of light hues with dark hues. Now that we are supplied with a decimal scale of grays, represented by divisions of the neutral axis, N1, N2, etc., and a corresponding decimal scale of value for each of the ten hues ranged about the equator, R1, R2, YR1, YR2, Y1, Y2, GY1, GY2, and so on, traced by ten equidistant meridians from black to white, it is not difficult to foresee what the mixture of any two colors will produce, whether they are of the same level of value, as in the colors of the equator already considered, or whether they are of different levels. For instance, let us mix a light yellow, Y7, with a dark red, R3. They are neighbors in hue, but well removed in value. A line joining them centers at YR5. This describes the result of their mixture, a value intermediate between 7 and 3, with a hue intermediate between R and Y. It is a yellow-red of middle value, popularly called dark orange. But while this term, dark orange, rarely means the same color to three different people, these measured scales give to YR5 an unmistakable meaning, just as the musical scale gives an unmistakable significance to the note of its score. Evidently, this way of writing colors by their degrees of value and hue gives clearness to what would otherwise be hard to express by the color terms in common use. If Y9 and R5 be chosen for mixture, we know at once that they unite in YR7, which is two steps of the value scale above the middle, while Y6 and R2 make YR4, which is one step below the middle. Charts prepared with this system show each of these colors and their mixture with exactness. The foregoing mixtures of dark reds and light yellows are typical of the union of light and dark values of any neighboring hues, such as yellow and green, green and blue, blue and purple, or purple and red. Next let us think of the result of mixing different values in opposite hues, as, for instance, YR7 and B3. To this combination the color sphere gives a ready answer, for the middle of a straight line through the sphere, and joining them, coincides with the neutral center, showing that they balance in neutral gray. This is also true of any opposite pair of surface hues where the values are equally removed from the equator. Suppose we substitute familiar flowers for the notation then YR7 becomes the buttercup, and B3 is the wild violet. But in comparing the two, the eye is more stimulated by the buttercup than by the violet, not alone because it is lighter, but because it is stronger in chroma, that is, farther away from the neutral axis of the sphere, and in fact out beyond its surface, as shown in figure 11. The head of a pin stuck in toward the axis on the seventh level of YR may represent the ninth step in the scale of chroma, such as the buttercup, while the modest violet with a chroma of only four is shown by its position to be nearer the neutral axis than the brilliant buttercup by five steps of chroma. This is the third dimension of color and must be included in our notation. So we write the buttercup YR 7 over 9, and the violet B 3 over 4, chroma always being written below to the right of hue, and value always above. This is the invariable order, 
hue value over chroma a line joining the head of the pin mentioned above with b3 over 4 does not pass through the center of the sphere and its middle point is nearer the buttercup than the neutral axis showing that the hues of the buttercup and violet do not balance in gray the neutral center is a balancing point for colors this raises the question what is balance of color artists criticize the color schemes of paintings as being too light or too dark unbalanced in value too weak or too strong unbalanced in chroma and too hot or too cold unbalanced in hue showing that this is a fundamental idea underlying all color arrangements let us assume that the center of the sphere is the neutral balancing point for all colors which will be best shown by maxwell discs in chapter 5 paragraphs 106 to 112 then color points equally removed from the center must balance one another thus white balances black lighter red balances darker blue green middle red balances middle blue green in short every straight line through this center indicates opposite qualities that balance one another the color points so found are said to be complementary for each supplies what is needed to complement or balance the other in hue value and chroma the true complement of the buttercup then is not the violet which is too weak in chroma to balance its strong opposite we have no blue flower that can equal the chroma of the buttercup some other means must be found to produce a balance one way is to use more of the weaker color thus we can make a bunch of buttercups and violets using twice as many of the latter so that the eye sees an area of blue twice as great as the area of yellow red area as a compensation for inequalities of hue value and chroma will be further described under the harmony of color in chapter seven but before leaving this illustration of the buttercup and violet it is well to consider another color path connecting them which does not pass through the sphere but around it figure twelve such a path swinging around from yellow red to blue slants downward in value and passes through yellow green yellow green and blue green tracing a sequence of hue of which each step is less chromatic than its predecessor this diminishing sequence is easily written thus y r eight over nine y seven over eight g y six over seven g five over six b g four over five b three over four and is shown graphically in figure twelve its hue sequence is described by the initials y r y g y g b g and b its value sequence appears in the upper numerals eight seven six five four and three while the chroma sequence is included in the lower numerals nine eight seven six five and four this gives a complete statement of the sequence defining its peculiarity that at each change of hue there is a regular decrease of value and chroma nature seems to be partial to this sequence constantly reiterating it in yellow flowers with their darker green leaves and underlying shadows in springtime she may contract its range making the blue more green and the yellow less red but in autumn she seems to widen the range presenting strong contrasts of yellow red and purple blue every day she plays upon the values of this sequence from the strong contrasts of light and shadow at noon to the hardly perceptible differences at twilight the chroma of this sequence expands during the summer to strong colors and contracts in winter to grays indeed nature who would seem to be the source of our notions of color harmony rarely repeats herself yet is endlessly balancing inequalities of hue value and chroma by compensations of quantity 
so subtle is this equilibrium that it is taken for granted and forgotten except when some violent disturbance disarranges it such as an earthquake or a thunderstorm the triple nature of color balance illustrated the simplest idea of balance is the equilibrium of two halves of a stick supported at its middle point if one end is heavier than the other the support must be moved nearer to that end but since color unites three qualities we must seek some type of triple balance the game of jack straws illustrates this when the disturbance of one piece involves the displacement of two others the action of three children on a floating plank or the equilibrium of two acrobats carried on the shoulders of a third may also serve as examples triple balance may be graphically shown by three discs in contact two of them are suspended by their centers while they remain in touch with a third supported on a pivot as in figure fourteen let us call the lowest disc q h and the lateral discs value v and chroma c any dip or rotation of the lower disc h will induce sympathetic action in the two lateral discs v and c when h is inclined both v and c change their relations to it if h is raised vertically both v and c dip outward if h is rotated both v and c rotate but in opposite directions indeed any disturbance of v affects h and c while h and v respond to any movement of c so we must be prepared to realize that any change of one color quality involves readjustment of the other two color balance soon leads to a study of optics in one direction to aesthetics in another and to mathematical proportions in a third and any attempt at an easy solution of its problems is not likely to succeed it is a very complicated question whose closest counterpart is to be sought in musical rhythms the fall of musical impulses upon the ear can make us gay or sad and there are color groups which acting through the eye can convey pleasure or pain to the mind a colorist is keenly alive to these feelings of satisfaction or annoyance and consciously or unconsciously he rejects certain combinations of color and accepts others successful pictures and decorative schemes are due to some sort of balance uniting light and shade value warmth and coolness hue with brilliancy and grayness chroma for when they fail to please the mind at once begins to search for the unbalanced quality and complains that the color is too hot too dark or too crude this effort to establish pleasing proportions may be unconscious in one temperament while it becomes a matter of definite analysis in another emerson claimed that the unconscious only is complete we gladly permit those whose color instinct is unerring and how few they are to neglect all rules and set formulas but education is concerned with the many who have not this gift any real progress in color education must come not from a blind imitation of past successes but by a study into the laws which they exemplify to exactly copy fine japanese prints or persian rugs or renaissance tapestries while it cultivates an appreciation of their refinements does not give one the power to create things equally beautiful the masterpieces of music correctly rendered do not of necessity make a composer the musician besides the study of masterpieces absorbs the science of counterpoint and records by an unmistakable notation the exact character of any new combination of musical intervals which he conceives so must the art of the colorist be furnished with a scientific basis and a clear form of color notation this will record the successes and failures of the past and aid in a search by contrast and analysis for the fundamentals of color balance without a measured and systematic notation attempts to describe color harmony 
only produce hazy generalities of little value in describing our sensations and fail to express the essential differences between good and bad color end of section five section six of a color notation by albert henry munsell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in april two thousand seventeen appendix to chapter three false color balance there is a widely accepted error that red yellow and blue are primary although brewster's theory was long ago dropped when the elements of color vision proved to be red green and violet blue the late professor rood called attention to this in chapters eight and nine of his book modern chromatics which appeared in eighteen seventy nine yet we find it very generally taught in school nor does the harm end there for placing red yellow and blue equidistant in a circle with orange green and purple as intermediates the teacher goes on to state that opposite hues are complementary red is thus made the complement of green yellow is thus made the complement of purple and blue is thus made the complement of orange unfortunately each of these statements is wrong and if tested by the mixture of colored lights or with maxwell's rotating discs their falsity is evident there can be no doubt that green is not the complement of red nor purple of yellow nor orange of blue for neither one of these pairs unites as it should in a balanced neutrality and a total test of the circle gives great excess of orange showing that red and yellow usurp too great a portion of the circumference starting from a false basis the brewster theory can only lead to unbalanced and inharmonious effects of color the fundamental color sensations are red green and violet blue red has for its true complement blue green green has for its true complement red purple and violet blue has for its true complement yellow all of the hues in the right hand column being compound sensations the sensation of green is not due to a mixture of yellow and blue as the absorptive action of pigments might lead one to think green is fundamental and not made by mixing any hues of the spectrum while yellow is not fundamental but caused by the mingled sensations of red and green this is easily proved by a controlled spectrum for all yellow reds yellows and green yellows can be matched by certain proportions of red and green light all blue greens blues and purple blues can be obtained by the union of green and violet light while purple blue purple and red purple result from the union of violet and red light but there is no point where a mixture gives red green or violet blue they are the true primaries whose mixtures produce all other hues studio and schoolroom practice still cling to the discredited theory claiming that if it fails to describe our color sensations yet it may be called practically true of pigments because a red yellow and blue pigment suffice to imitate most natural colors this discrepancy between pigment mixture and retinal mixture becomes clear as soon as one learns the physical makeup and behavior of paints spectral analysis shows that no pigment is a pure example of the dominant hue which it sends to the eye take for example the very chromatic pigments representing red and green such as vermilion and emerald green if each emitted a single pure hue free from trace of any other hue then their mixture would appear yellow as when spectral red and green unite but instead of yellow their mixture produces a warm gray called brown or dull salmon and this is to be inferred from their spectra 
where it is seen that vermilion emits some green and purple as well as its dominant color while the green also sends some blue and red light to the eye thus stray hues from other parts of the spectrum tend to neutralize the yellow sensation which would be strong if each of the pigments were pure in the spectral sense pigment absorption affects all palette mixtures and failing to obtain a satisfactory yellow by mixture of red and green painters use original yellow pigments such as aureolin cadmium and lead chromate each of them also impure but giving a dominant sensation of yellow did the eye discriminate as does the ear when it analyzes the separate tones of a chord then we should recognize that yellow pigments emit both red and green rays white light dispersed into a colored band by one prism may have the process reversed by a second prism so that the eye sees again only white light but this would not be so did not the balance of red green and violet blue sensations remain undisturbed all our ideas of color harmony are based upon this fundamental relation and if pigments are to render harmonious effects we must learn to control their impurities so as to preserve a balance of red green and violet blue otherwise the excessive chroma and value of red and yellow pigments so overwhelm the lesser degrees of green and blue pigments that no balance is possible and the colorist of fine perception must reject not alone the theoretical but also the practical outcome of a red yellow blue theory some of the points raised in this discussion are rather subtle for students and may well be left until they arise in a study of optics but the teacher should grasp them clearly so as not to be led into false statements about primary and complementary hues end of section six section seven of a color notation by albert henry munsell this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Abai in April 2017. Chapter 4 Prismatic Color Pure color is seen in the spectrum of sunlight. The strongest sensation of color is gained in a darkened room with a prism used to split a beam of sunlight into its various wavelengths. Through a narrow slit there enters a straight pencil of light which we are accustomed to think of as white, although it is a bundle of various colored rays, or waves of ether, whose union and balance is so perfect that no single ray predominates. Cover the narrow slit and we are plunged in darkness. Admit the beam and the eye feels a powerful contrast between the spot of light on the floor and its surrounding darkness. Place a triangular glass prism near the slit to intercept the beam of white light, and suddenly there appears on the opposite wall a band of brilliant colors. This delightful experiment rivets the eye by the beauty and purity of its hues. All other colors seem weak by comparison. Their weakness is due to impurity, for all pigments and dyes reflect portions of hues other than their dominant one, which tend to gray and diminish their chroma. But prismatic color is pure, or very nearly so, because the shape of the glass refracts each hue and separates it by the length of its ether wave. These waves have been measured, and science can name each hue by its wavelength. Thus, a certain red is known as M6867, and a certain green sensation is M5269. Without attempting any scientific analysis of color, let it be said that Sir Isaac Newton made his series of experiments in 1687, and was privileged to name this color sequence by seven steps, which he called red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and indigo. Later, a scientist named Fraunhofer discovered fine black lines crossing the solar spectrum and marked them with letters of the alphabet from A to H. 
these with the wavelength serve to locate every hue and define every step in the sequence since newton's time it has been proved that only three of the spectral hues are primary that is a green a red and a violet blue while their mixture produces all other gradations by receiving the spectrum on an opaque screen with fine slits that fit the red and green waves so they alone pass through these two primary hues can be received on mirrors inclined at such an angle as to unite on another screen where instead of red or green the eye sees only yellow footnote the fact that the spectral union of red and green makes yellow is a matter of surprise to practical workers in color who are familiar with the action of pigments but unfamiliar with spectrum analysis yellow seems to them a primary and indispensable color because it cannot be made by the union of red and green pigments another surprise is awaiting them when they hear that the yellow and blue of the spectrum make white for all their experience with paints goes to prove that yellow and blue unite to form green attention is called to this difference between the mixture of colored light and of colored pigments not with the idea of explaining it here but to emphasize their difference for in the next chapter we shall describe the practical making of a color sphere with pigments which would be quite impractical could we have only the colors of the spectrum to work with see appendix to preceding chapter End of footnote. a similar arrangement of slits and mirrors for the green and violet blue proves that they unite to make blue while a third experiment shows that the red and violet blue can unite to make purple so yellow blue green and purple are called secondary hues because they result from the mixture of the three primaries red green and violet blue in comparing these two color lists we see that the indigo and orange of sir isaac newton have been discarded both are indefinite and refer to variable products of the vegetable kingdom violet is also borrowed from the same kingdom and in order to describe a violet we say it is a purple violet or blue violet as the case may be just as we describe an orange as a red orange or a yellow orange their color difference is not expressed by the terms orange or violet but by the words red yellow blue or purple all of which are true color names and arouse an unmixed color image in the nursery a child learns to use the simple color names red yellow green blue and purple when familiarity with the color sphere makes him relate them to each other and place them between black and white by their degree of light and strength there will be no occasion to revert to vegetables animals minerals or the ever varying hues of sea and sky to express his color sensations another experiment accentuates the difference between spectral and pigment color when the spectrum is spread on the screen by the use of a prism and a second prism is placed inverted beyond the first it regathers the dispersed rays back into their original beam making a white spot on the floor this proves that all the colored rays of light combine to balance each other in whiteness but if pigments which are the closest possible imitation of these hues are united on a painter's palette either by the brush or the knife they make gray and not white this is another illustration of the behavior of pigments for instead of uniting to form white they form gray which is a darkened or impure form of white and lest this should be attributed to a chemical reaction between the various matters that serve as pigments the experiment can be carried out without allowing one pigment to touch another by using maxwell discs as will be shown in the next chapter before leaving these prismatic colors let us study them in the light of what has already been learned of color dimensions not only do they present different values but also different chromas their values range from darkness at each end where red and purple become visible to a brightness in the greenish yellow which is almost white 
so on the color tree described in chapter two paragraph thirty four yellow has the highest branch green is lower red is below the middle with blue and purple lower down near black then in chroma they range from the powerful stimulation of the red to the soothing purple with green occupying an intermediate step this is also given on the color tree by the length of its branches in figure fifteen the vertical curve describes the values of the spectrum as they grade from red through yellow green blue and purple the horizontal curve describes the chromas of the spectrum in the same sequence while the third curve leaning outward is obtained by uniting the first two by two planes at right angles to one another and sums up the three qualities by a single descriptive line now the red and purple ends are far apart and science forbids their junction because of their great difference in wavelength but the mind is prone to unite them in order to produce the red purples which we see in clouds at sunset in flowers and grapes and the amethyst indeed it has been done unhesitatingly in most color schemes in order to supply the opposite of green this gives a slanting circuit joining all the branch ends of the color tree and has been likened to the rings of saturn in chapter one paragraph seventeen a prismatic color sphere with a little effort of the imagination we can picture a prismatic color sphere using only the colors of light in a cylindrical chamber is hung a diaphanous ball similar to a huge soap bubble which can display color on its surface without obscuring its interior then at the proper points of the surrounding wall three pure beams of colored light are admitted one red another green and the third violet blue they fall at proper levels on three sides of the sphere while their intermediate gradations encircle the sphere with a complete spectrum plus the needed purple as they penetrate the sphere they unite to balance each other in neutrality pure whiteness is at the top and by some imaginary means their light gradually diminishes until they disappear in darkness below this ideal color system is impossible in the present state of our knowledge and implements even were it possible its immaterial hues could not serve to dye materials or paint pictures pigments are and will in all probability continue to be the practical agents of coloristic productions however reluctant the scientist may be to accept them as the basis of a color system it is true that they are chemically impure and imperfectly represent the colors of light some of them fade rapidly and undergo chemical change as in the notable case of a green pigment tested by this measured system which in a few weeks lost four steps of chroma gained two steps of value and swung into a bluer hue but the color sphere to be next described is worked out with a few reliable pigments mostly natural earths whose fading is a matter of years and so slight as to be almost imperceptible besides its principal hues are preserved in safekeeping by imperishable animals which can be used to correct any tendency of the pigments to distort the measured intervals of the color sphere this meets the most serious objection to a pigment system Without it, a child has nothing tangible which he can keep in constant view to imitate and memorize. With it, he builds up a mental image of measured relations that describe every color in nature, including the fleeting hues of the rainbow, although they appear but for a moment at rare intervals. Finally, it furnishes a simple notation which records every color sensation by a letter and two numerals with the enlargement of his mental power he will unite these in a comprehensive grasp of the larger relations of color end of section seven section eight of a color notation by albert henry munsell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in april two thousand seventeen Appendix to Chapter 4 Children's Color Studies 
these reproductions of children's work are given as proof that color charm and good taste may be cultivated from the start five middle hues are first taught by the use of special crayons and later with watercolors they represent the equator of the color sphere see plate one a circle midway between the extremes of color light and color strength and are known as middle red middle yellow middle green middle blue and middle purple these are starting points for training the eye to measure regular scales of value and chroma only with such a trained judgment is it safe to undertake the use of strong colors beginners should avoid strong color extreme red yellow and blue are discordant they shriek and swear mark twain calls roxana's gown a volcanic eruption of infernal splendors yet there are some who claim that a child craves them and must have them to produce a thrill so also does he crave candies matches and the carving knife he covets the trumpet fire gong and bass drum for their thrill but who would think them necessary to the musical training of the ear like the blazing billboard and the circus wagon they may be suffered out of doors but such boisterous sounds and color sprees are unfit for the schoolroom quiet color is the mark of good taste refinement in dress and the furnishings of the home is attractive but we shrink from those who are loud in their speech or their clothing if we wish our children to become well-bred is it logical to begin by encouraging barbarous tastes their young minds are very open to suggestion they quickly adopt our standards and the blame must fall upon us if they acquire crude color habits yellow journalism and ragtime tunes will not help their taste in speech or song nor will violent hues improve their taste in matters of color balance of color is to be sought artists and decorators are well aware of a fact that slowly dawns upon the student namely that color harmony is due to the preservation of a subtle balance and impossible by the use of extremes this balance of color resides more within the spherical surface of this system than in the excessive chromas which project beyond it is futile to encourage children in efforts to rival the poppy or buttercup even with the strongest pigments obtainable their sunlit points give pleasure because they are surrounded and balanced by blue ether and white green fields were these conditions reversed so that the flowers appeared as little spots of blue or green in great fields of blazing red orange and yellow our pained eyes would be shut in disgust the painter knows that pigments cannot rival the brilliancy of the buttercup and poppy enhanced by their surroundings what is more he does not care to attempt it nor does the musician wish to imitate the screech of a siren or the explosion of a gun these are not subjects for art harmonious sounds are the study of the musician and tuned colors are the materials of the colorist corot in landscape and titian velasquez and whistler in figure painting show us that nature's richest effects and most beautiful color are enveloped in an atmosphere of gray beauty of color lies in tempered relations music rarely touches the extreme range of sound and harmonious color rarely uses the extremes of color light or color strength regular scales in the middle register are first given to train the ear and so should the eye be first familiarized with medium degrees of color this system provides measured scales established by special instruments and is able to select the middle points of red yellow green blue and purple as a basis for comparing and relating all colors these five middle colors form a chromatic tuning fork it is far better that children should first become familiar with these tuned color intervals which are harmonious in themselves rather than begin by blundering among unrelated degrees of harsh and violent color who would think of teaching the musical scale with a piano out of tune 
the tuning of color cannot be left to personal whim the wide discrepancies of red yellow and blue which have been falsely taught as primary colors can no more be tuned by a child than the musical novice can tune his instrument each of these hues has three variable factors and scientific tests are necessary to measure and relate their uneven degrees of hue value and chroma visual estimates of color without the help of any standard for comparison are continually distorted by doubt guesswork and the fatigue of the eye hardly two persons can agree in the intelligible description of color not only do individuals differ but the same eye will vary in its estimate from day to day a frequent assumption that all strong pigments are equal in chroma is far from the truth and involves beginners in many mishaps thus the strongest blue-green chromium sesquioxide is but half the chroma of its red complement the sulphuret of mercury yet ignorance is constantly leading to their unbalanced use indeed some are still unaware that they are the complements of each other it is evident that the fundamental scales of hue value and chroma must be established by scientific measures not by personal bias this system is unique in the possession of such scales made possible by the devising of special instruments for the measurement of color and can therefore be trusted as a permanent basis for training the color sense the examples in plates two and three show how successfully the tuned crayons cards and watercolors of this system lead a child to fine appreciations of color harmony plate two color studies with tuned crayons in the lower grades children have made every example on this plate with no other material than the five crayons of middle hue tempered with gray and black a color sphere is always kept in the room for reference and five color balls to match the five middle hues are placed in the hands of the youngest pupils starting with these middle points in the scales of value and chroma they learn to estimate rightly all lighter and darker values all weaker and stronger chromas and gradually build up to a disciplined judgment of color each study can be made the basis of many variations by a simple change of one color element as suggested in the text one butterfly yellow and black crayon vary by using any single crayon with black two dish red crayon blue and green crayons for back and foreground vary by using the two opposites of any color chosen for the dish and omitting the two neighboring colors see number four three hiawatha's canoe yellow crayon with rim and name in green vary color of canoe keeping the rim a neighboring color see number four four color circle gray crayon for center and five crayons spaced equidistant this gives the invariable order red yellow green blue purple never use all five in a single design either use a color and its two neighbors or a color and its two opposites by mingling touches of any two neighbors the intermediates are made and named yellow red orange green yellow blue green purple blue violet and red purple abbreviated the circle reads r y r y g y g b g b p b p r p five rosette red cross in center green leaves blue field black outline vary as in number two six rosette green center and edge of leaves purple field and black accents vary color of center keeping field two colors distant seven played use any three crayons with black vary the trio eight folding screen yellow field lightly applied green and black edge 
make lighter and darker values of each color and arrange in scales graded from black to white nine rug light red field with solid red center border pattern and edges of gray this is called self color change to each of the crayons ten rug light yellow field and solid center with purple and black in border design vary by change of ground keeping design two colors distant and darkened with black eleven lattice yellow with black alternate green and blue lozenges vary by keeping the lozenges of two neighboring colors but one color removed from that of the lattice for principles involved in these color groups see chapter three plate three color studies with tuned water colors in the upper grades previous work with measured scales made by the tuned crayons and tested by reference to the color sphere have so trained the color judgment that children may now be trusted with more flexible material they have memorized the equable degrees of color on the equator of the sphere and found how lighter colors may balance darker colors how small areas of stronger chroma may be balanced by larger masses of weaker chroma and in general gained a disciplined color sense definite impressions and clear thinking have taken the place of guesswork and blundering thus before reaching the secondary school they are put in possession of the color faculty by a system and notation similar to that which was devised centuries ago for the musical sense no system however logical will produce the artist but every artist needs some systematic training at the outset and this simple method by measured scales is believed to be the best yet devised each example on this plate may be made the basis of many variants by small changes in the color steps as suggested in the text and further elaborated in chapter six indeed the studies reproduced on plates two and three are but a handful among hundreds of pleasing results produced in a single school one pattern purple and green the two united and thinned with water will give the ground vary with any other color pair two pattern figure in middle red with darker blue green accent ground of middle yellow grayed with slight addition of the green and red vary with purple in place of blue green three japanese teapot middle red with background of lighter yellow and foreground of grayed middle yellow four variant on number three middle yellow with slight addition of green foreground the same with more red and background of middle gray five group background of yellow red lighter vase in yellow green and darker vase of green with slight addition of black vary by inversion of the colors in ground and darker vase six wall decoration frieze pattern made of cat tails and leaves the leaves of blue green with black tails of yellow red with black and ground of the two colors united and thinned with water wall of blue green slightly grayed by additions of the two colors in the frieze dado could be a match of the cat tails slightly grayer see figure twenty three page eighty two seven group foreground in purple blue grayed with black vase of purple red and background in lighter yellow red grayed for analysis of the groups and means of recording them see chapter three end of section eight